Good afternoon. My name is Julie Suarez and I'm Associate Dean for Land Grant Affairs in Cornell's College of Agriculture and Life Sciences. Welcome to our panel discussion today on changing climate, changing farms. I'm here today with Dr. Ariel Ortiz Borbeo, an Associate Professor in the Dyson School, part of the SC Johnson College of Business and the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences. Ariel's expertise is as a climate economist with a focus on agricultural sustainability. Oftentimes, we find that food is left out of the climate change media coverage, as we're way more focused on the immediacy of short-term impacts of climate change, like more severe storms and, of course, recently, wildfires. But Ariel and I hope to leave you in this discussion today with one main take-home. Climate change is inevitably impacting global agricultural productivity now and will in the years to come, which will significantly increase opportunities for farmers as well as climate-friendly innovators in New York State, both to grow more food and to take advantage of negative emissions technologies and strategies. Ariel, sometimes when we're rooted in one community like we are in New York State, we don't always look at what's occurring in the global environment. Your work has really focused on global and U.S. productivity of agriculture or the ability of farmers around the world to utilize their resources as efficiently as possible to feed a growing world. We can all assume that everyone knows that climate change will impact food production from extremes in temperatures as well as water availability, but your models really show some potentially insightful and a little bit disturbing impacts about our society's general ability to continue to rely on greater efficiency gains over the years to feed our increasing population. Can you first take us briefly through some of your recent work? Yes, thank you, first of all, Julie, for having me. Very excited to be here. Um, and before I start talking about um, the perhaps the more scary part, I start with um, how far we've come as you know as uh, humanity. In, in the slide that I'm showing uh, here, you can see that the population has grown about you know twofold since the 1960s. And when you look at the rise of agricultural production, it has more than tripled. So growth in output in production has risen faster than population. A lot of that growth in, pro in agricultural production has been mostly driven by inputs. So we're talking about more fertilizer, land put into agricultural production. However, starting about in the, in two, let's say 60s, 70s, um, you know, I, closer to the year 2000, a lot of that growth has been now fueled by growth in productivity. So we're increasingly more productive at a global scale, right? And the question is, what's gonna happen in the decades to come? In the next slide, you see that that growth in productivity is actually um, heterogeneous uh, across space. So there are countries that are growing much faster than others. The US, for instance, is one of the countries is, let's say it's ahead of the pack. Uh, it's in the dark, um, you know, darker color here. Whereas there's countries in uh, Eastern Europe and South Saharan Africa that are growing at a very uh, slow rate. Um, and the question is, how has climate change already affected global agricultural productivity? In the next slide, we see that climate change is not necessarily something that is just think, a thing of the future. These are historical trends and show a clear pattern of warming um, during our lifetimes and, and actually going back to the um, uh, Industrial Revolution. So if weather is very important for agricultural production, then the question is how these recent trends have affected global agricultural productivity. So in the next slide, I'm gonna show you a figure from a, a work in progress, it's still under review, where we try to characterize how agriculture responds to weather fluctuations. And what you see in the first panel A is that higher levels of temperature tend to be associated with lower agricultural productivity. And what we do with, um, with this um, information is that we link this with contrafactual weather trajectories. So we team up with climate scientists here at Cornell, and they give us versions of the world of weather. So in the next slide, you'll see that. You'll see weather conditions in a world where, um, the next slide, exactly. So we see um, uh, climate conditions in a world where there's greenhouse gases, so where humans are having an influence on the climate system on the left, and also a counterfactual world without human interactions uh, with the climate system. So what we see here is that the uh, temperature has really remained stable in the world without greenhouse gases, but it rises in the world with, uh, with human forcing. So 
using this information, combining these two sources of information, the, the previous slide and how agriculture responds to weather and these counterfactual um, uh, scenarios, we then establish how much has anthropogenic climate change affected global agriculture productivity, which is what we see in the next slide. And, and our findings at the global scale is that since the 1960s, global agricultural productivity has been uh, has dropped by about 20 percent because of anthropogenic climate change to put this in context this is equivalent to wiping out seven years of productivity growth since the 1960s and so it's uh, fairly substantial Ariel, thank you. And again, I always find your work fascinating because we've done a great job in the US and in some other sectors of increasing our agricultural efficiencies over time, but we can tell that climate is going to have such a huge impact on where we need to be in the future to feed ourselves. So again, I can see that the global food system is gonna have some significant challenges ahead. Uh, when we think about the overall need identified by the UN a few years ago of doubling food production to meet the world's growing needs by 2050. So let's take this just a step closer to home, if you don't mind, Ariel. And let's think about the United States, which is, I think your earlier slide showed, has long been known as a food production powerhouse. But what does your modeling work really show will be the impact on the six major crops agricultural productivity yields under a scenario of increasing climate extremes, which certainly we're experiencing now and will do so in the future? Great, um, great question. And um, in part of this work that is still ongoing, we're also going to look at different uh, regional impacts. But in previous work, as uh, we'll see in, in the next slide, we focus on how is U.S. agriculture growing um, um, since the 1960s again. So how is U.S. agriculture becoming more or less resilient to particularly high temperatures. So we've seen massive growth in productivity, which is still heterogeneous within the US, but how has that growth uh, been accomplished? And what we see here is that in our regional analysis, uh, so this is a paper uh, published a couple of years ago, is that the Midwest in particular, uh, mostly Eastern agriculture, um, but mostly the Midwest has grown increasingly sensitive to high temperatures. Um, if we focus on the Midwest uh, plot there, what you see is that a summer that was two degrees warmer prior to the 1980s led to a reduction in productivity of about 10%, 8%. After the 1980s, that same warmer summer of two degrees Celsius led to a reduction of about 30%. So that's three times more sensitive to those hot summer conditions. And that's without thinking about what's coming in the future, which is uh, higher temperatures. In this study, we find that um, that it, it's primarily two factors that are driving this growth in sensitivity in the ag sector, primarily in the eastern part of the U.S., and it's the change in the composition of agricultural production. So a lot of uh, the Midwest has primarily specialized in crop production relative to the what it used to do, and, and that makes it more vulnerable to that. In the, in the in the Northeast, it's been more stable, so it hasn't been uh, specialized in the same way that in the, mid, the Midwest. But when you look at the crop output, just, just take the livestock away, you look at the crop output, we also see the same pattern, okay, it's where we see that crop production is becoming increasingly sensitive to these um, extreme events. So it, there's a change in the condition of what farmers produce, and then a change in the sensitivity of crops um, uh, over time. Um, so that's a lot. So you can see here in the Northeast that it, there's a slight increase. So that includes New York state, obviously, um, a small, a, a small increase in the sensitivity uh, here, as you can see from the higher bars here to the right, uh, relative to the, uh, to the gray bars. Ariel, thanks again. I really appreciate your insightful analysis, particularly your shouting out a little bit the difference between Midwest agriculture and Northeast agriculture, which of course is where I'm particularly passionate about is what's happening in our home state of New York, which is of course headquartered in the Northeast. So let's bring this discussion home a little bit to New York and I'll certainly state unequivocally and proudly that our state's farmers and food system entrepreneurs produce some of the best tasting farm and food products anywhere. Of course, I'm a little biased, but you know, you think about our great 
wines or wonderful dairy products and cheeses, ruby frost and snapdragon apples and other specialty vegetable crops, and of course, fabulous cheeses produced throughout the year. Our Cornell faculty have really done a lot of work over the past two decades in mapping out what the science tells us about our changing climate. And as we know, we're gonna see greater extremes in water availability from droughts to floods, but we will have water and not every region in our country is fortunate enough to be able to have that in the future. Um, sometimes in the exact same growing season, we're gonna have uh, challenges to more growing degrees available and also earlier frosts uh, in some, followed by really increasingly warm days, which make as a farmer, the ability to manage growing products a little bit more challenging. Um, so we're going to see hotter temperatures in the summer and we'll see ever increasing pest and disease challenges, which is really gonna make innovation for sustainable solutions, which is what we're talking about in the Grow New York region and even greater need in the future. Through it all, of course, in New York, we're going to retain our unique advantage of being close to an incredible population of about 100 million eaters on the eastern seaboard and wonderful human capital resources in the form of our farmer entrepreneurs and innovators and, of course, our fabulous uh, faculty who are engaged in finding science-based solutions. So, Ariel, when we think about New York agriculture changing in the future, more extremes of weather temperature, uh, what insights can we glean from your work to New York State's opportunities in the the future? That, that's a great question, uh, Julie. And, and I see them uh, twofold. So we, we think about uh, adaptation to climate change, uh, right? So these are you know, the new practices, um, you know, which is mostly what you were talking about at the beginning of, of, of your intervention. Um, and that's um, generally how we think about, you know, in terms of a challenge for um, in New York agriculture, but there's also opportunities, right? So farmers can be part of the solution as well, right? So it's not everything, it's not only a challenge, it could be um, a solution. So in the next slide, I'm gonna show you a global figure showing where emissions of greenhouse gases come from globally, right? Because this is a global problem, right? Emissions don't really um, um, matter where they come from because they all mix in the atmosphere. And you can see is that the food system overall is responsible for about a quarter of all the emissions globally in the whole system, okay? So that's a major uh, um, a major part of, of the climate change problem. And um, in that same regard, it's part of the problem, but it's also part of the solution because this is where a lot of the mitigation and the reduction in emissions can come from. So this is where I see that in New York and well, in the U.S. in general, but in New York in particular, there are major opportunities for making farmers part of that solution and being um, active participants to the sequestration of carbon and, and trying to uh, stabilize our climate system. Um, and so that brings me to something that you are involved with, Julie. Um, and um, so recently, last year, uh, the governor, uh, New York uh, Governor uh, uh, Cuomo, and the state legislator adopted the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. It basically sets up the, the, uh, the road for a very ambitious uh, uh, goal to uh, bring New Year's state's economy to a need zero emission uh, by year 2050. Uh, and in some of... Uh, some Cornelians, including you, are involved in, in the uh, advisory boards that are set up for uh, associated with this act. So can you tell us a little bit more about that? Ariel, I'm so glad you asked that question. You know, New York is really leading the way in trying to think about utilizing our agricultural uh, landscapes and our working forests as a means for entrepreneurship and innovation when it comes to solving the current climate crisis. So when I think about where our opportunities are, and right now New York State is embarking on this wonderful process that's full of a lot of opportunities for public input and has a huge advisory council structure, which is fabulous. Um, when I think about that framework that we're trying to wrestle with and put forward with for solutions to the future, the number one opportunity for our farmers is really how do we develop a market for enhanced farmer profitability, which will really allow farmers to take advantage of a profit stream for ecosystem services, such as, of course, storing carbon. So it's a tremendous opportunity not only for farmers to reduce their own greenhouse gas emissions, but also to serve as a really positive force for kind of the global good in terms of figuring out negative negative emissions technologies, as well as farm management strategies that can better sequester carbon in our soils so that we can enable our farms to really capitalize on the drive to net zero economy. 
Farmers are, of course, not overall the biggest emitters of greenhouse gas emissions, and I appreciate, Ariel, you're shouting that out, but we have probably the best opportunity in agriculture to really give our farmers a profit stream uh, for their abilities to store carbon in the future. But part of that development of an ecosystem marketplace is really going to come from our faculty and the research that we have and the innovation that we have in New York State, um, because we have to drive sustainability through advances both in, again, negative emissions technology technologies and farm management strategies. And then how do we make sure that those technologies and strategies are commercialized and turned into innovative private sector solutions? You know, when I think about new technologies like the usage of UV light, to help control bacterial diseases and specialty crops, utilizing mobile pyrolysis units to create biochar, which will help sequester carbon in our soils and in our forest, or even things that we're not really thinking of yet, like plant breeding for enhanced photosynthesis to really capture carbon from the atmosphere and store it deeper into the soil. When we think about this area, our potential for ag-based climate-friendly solutions, in my opinion, is really limited solely and only by our imaginations, followed closely by our ability as a society to invest resources to develop science-based strategies that work, and then incentives to farmers to carry them out so that we're compensating our farmers for helping us all solve the climate crisis. So when we think about it, again, the area with the greatest potential for innovation in carbon storage really is our agricultural sector. And that's why I look forward to the Grow New York competition, because I think some of our private sector entrepreneurs really have the potential for advancement here. So one thing to leave you with is that we have incredible water in New York State, which is really important. We have great access to markets and we have access to incredible R&D from Cornell Cows as well as our private sector entrepreneurs. Before we end, I just wanted to make sure that we open this up for any questions from the audience uh, for a chat box of either Ariel or myself, because we did want to make sure we took some uh, audience participation. And I'm not, Very seeing, funny, Julie. I'm not seeing any questions. So Ariel, do you have a question? <laughs> Well, one question that I have is how would this, and I, and I don't know whether you might have the answer, but you, you'll tell me, um, is how are these efforts from New York State related to the federal, potential federal initiatives uh, coming down the uh, road? an excellent maybe that's a curveball i don't know <laughs> yeah no it's a really excellent question you know and i have to say we've seen a tremendous partnership between states on issues of climate with the u.s working lands uh, uh, with the u.s climate alliance which of course new york is a founding partner and a member of but we haven't seen much action from the federal government recently on climate change i think as we look to biden administration it's no secret at all that president-elect biden has already said he wants to rejoin the Paris Accords, which is fantastic. But where I think in you know, reports so far on um, the news media and the transition team documents really indicate that he wants to start thinking about how we change incentives to farmers so that they're recognized for their conservation strategies and for their climate friendly practices. And that's something that I'm really excited to see because I think we need to change the paradigm a little bit and encourage our farmers with appropriate financial incentives, both public investment and eventual private sector investment to generate an additional revenue stream for the adoption of climate friendly practices which frankly benefit us all yes i've heard a couple of programs that actually might be um, used for incorporating these uh, you know carbon sequestration services you know there's discussions about the c the crp so the conservation Re uh, reserve program and then the csp which is the conservation stewardship program which might be revamped um, to also incorporate uh, carbon sequestration and how farmers are compensated for their conversa uh, conservation efforts. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm excited, too, because at least in the campaign documents, uh, President-elect Biden was talking as well about making sure that there was an investment in agricultural R&D, specifically centered at land-grant universities, to make sure that we can develop science-based strategies, because that is the reality. If we're going to develop a private sector marketplace for carbon, which I think is where we're headed, we have to make sure that it's based with science. 
So we do have one question, and we'll see if we can get to that quick. Ariel, it's for you. To what extent will crop breeding address concerns related to higher temperatures and crop vulnerability? Excellent question. Yeah, great question. Um, the, the, I'll answer in two ways. W well, the first point, well, we don't have much time, but I'll, uh, the, the point that I make is that R&D is everything. So we're actually working exactly right now to determine how much R&D is needed to come to counterbalance all the, the negative effects or sort of the headwind that um, anthropogenic climate change represents at the global uh, level and also for the U.S. So we're actually working precisely on that. I think that we just need... You know, breeders and everyone involved in the R&D just needs the incentives to start coming up with the technology. Um, and, and that's uh, farmers in the same way that farmers are not necessarily just uh, capturing carbon um, as a hobby, they need incentives to uh, provide that service. So I think that's uh, what the next step should be is providing those incentives so that and then the, the um, R&D and the innovation will follow. Could not agree more. And thanks again, Ariel. To all of our listeners out there, we really thank you and appreciate your joining our discussion today. And Ariel and I hope that we provided you with some take home message, which is that our ability to feed a growing world it is inextricably linked to our changing climate and the need for overall innovation in the New York and Northeast farm and food community will only increase in the coming years as other significant growing regions around the globe face climate productivity challenges. So stick around. Next up, we have networking. Join us for some small group conversations about ag and clean tech, emerging crops and food systems. Have a chat about the things you heard during this or any of the panels today. So just a reminder to join, please head back into the lobby, click on Networking Nook, where you can join the conversation on the topic that most interests you. I know I'll be joining and I'm looking forward to the conversation on ag and clean tech. So I hope to see you there and thank you. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, everyone.